history, Europe has seen a lot of internal growth. They're the place where the Renaissance, the Reformation, all of these beneficial movements started. And what we actually think has happened is that European has be Europe has become too complacent in the view that anything good has to come from within their own borders. That they should they don't need to develop like outwards. They don't need to have like a global perspective, but that they only need this sort of growth internally. We think that that's what's causing a lot of the stagnation, a lot of the economic, cultural, and ultimately international problems in Europe today. And that's actually why we propose this motion. So what exactly are we talking about when we say that like immigration is a, has positive benefits for Europe? Well, we think we're specifically going to be talking about in immigration into Europe from outside like European countries. We're talking about all European countries, not necessarily just the EU, but we think that that's like a major playing point in this debate. In terms of our criteria for what sort of like a positive, positive advancement is or a positive future is, is first of all, we think that um, immigration would have to cause a better economic situation in Europe. Second of all, a more culturally accepting society, both like in terms of international views and also like between countries. And finally, we think it would improve clout on the international stage. Those are our criteria. That's what we stand by today. In terms of like what we view as immigration and beneficial, we think that like we're going to prove that immigration into Europe like has all these benefits. We support policies that would increase immigration. We still think that like potentially countries would still have standards for who they allow to immigrate. They might loosen them a little bit. They'd accept more like Im individuals into their country. We think immigration in general is quite a good thing. On our side of the house today, we're going to prove that immigrants have a lot to offer Europe and are an optimal like, source of uh, growth in Europe. And we think that said opposition has to prove that closing off borders, the borders in Europe, is a benefit to Europe as a whole and that immigrants contribute nothing to European society. Okay, so I'm, we're going to prove this in three points today. First, I'm going to talk about the idea of a practical revival of Europe. Then I'm going to talk, uh, talk about like cultural, the cultural aspects of Europe and the cultural climate and how that has to grow. Finally, my partner Ali is going to talk about immigration and how it helps in the international sphere in terms of increasing influence, in terms of like benefiting social cohesion. She's going to go into all that. So our first point today is that of practical revival. And our first sub point under that is that we think like under our model, there would obviously be more people in Europe. It's a fairly simple concept. There'd be more people immigrating, there'd be more people like voying populations. Okay, first of all, very simple. We think that like basically in Europe there's an aging population, right? Like most people are aware that there's a baby boom population, that there are more elderly people in Europe than there are people being born into society today. We think that that happens everywhere, but it's specifically problematic in Europe because they're, they've been quite like well off economically for the past little while, so they like can afford to have a declining population, more more women are working, etc., etc. It's a specific problem in Europe. It's m like more problematic there than elsewhere. Second of all, we think that individual countries are losing their populations. So countries like Greece, in the current economic crisis, their citizens are actually moving elsewhere in Europe. They're left with like very few people to work. We think that that's a huge problem. And actually, under our model, even though we understand that the people immigrating to these countries would be part of the EU, so they could like um, go between countries, we ultimately recognize that Greece and Spain and these countries are capable of incentivizing people or bringing people into their nation who they think will stay there, who they think will want to be like Greek citizens. They're capable of doing things like incentivizing immigration to Greece through like um, posters and through like sort of advertising, which is something that most countries do to promote immigration. And we also think that we don't feel like, we also think that it's beneficial because we can like incentivize these people to stay. Okay, so what's the benefit of having more people within these countries? We think that one of the problems of having like a small population is first of all with taxation. So you have to like give a lot of social programs to people who are elderly, who can no longer work. You don't have the same amount of people working and fulfilling their need in taxes to pay for it. Second of all, we think that um, immigration benefits Europe in terms of entrepreneurship. So first of all, when you have different communities coming in who say like promote different industries, a very basic example would be like an Indian food industry or like a different cultural industry that actually creates more jobs, it creates more innovation. We think bringing different mindsets, different skills, sets into a country creates jobs and that's something that Europe is considerably lacking right now. Finally we talk about like menial jobs. We actually think that a lot of countries in Europe have this expectation that individuals will get like cushy bureaucratic jobs. That's what happened in Greece. So for example in Greece they had a bureaucratic body that was in charge of taking care of a lake that had dried up 50 years ago. People were being paid for 
essentially doing nothing. We think that immigrants moving to these countries who come from a different cultural background, who actually you know, want to earn a wage and are willing to put in the work to do it, are far more likely to perform Point, menial tasks, tasks that aren't as cushy. We actually think that they're able to fulfill some of the jobs and potentially move like industry back into these nations. So they're willing to like work in a car plant, they're willing to do other jobs that like simply Europe has decided they're too good to do. Okay, so we also talk about different skills and expertise. So again, we talk about like a different lifestyle coming in. People who are like more willing to work like hard labor jobs, not even necessarily hard labor, but jobs that are not your typical bureaucrat Point intellectual out. jobs. We also think that Europe has this uh, potential to attract skilled individuals as well because their lifestyle is similar to that of countries in North America because also they, they attract like wealthy people from Point elsewhere there. in Europe because generally, or in the world, because generally they have a high standard of living. So we actually think that they would benefit from having more intellectuals and different like ways of viewing like their economic situation right now and that would benefit them in terms of getting out of like the current crisis. Okay, so second we Information then. Sure, actually. Madam, the benefits that you speak of only accrue if these immigrants are able to integrate. The vast majority of Europe's immigrants That's actually live my in enclaves that don't interact with the rest of Europe. Okay, we think that the reason that enclaves don't interact with European society is actually because there's too few of them. So there's not actually a huge Muslim population in France. A small population of people is easily bullied by a government, is easily targeted because they're not a major player in elections, because they're a very small amount of people who don't matter much. And we also think there's very few in, like opportunities for social contact. There's very few opportunities for you to meet a person of another race on the street and get to know them as an individual individual, get to know like their background and their culture and actually understand like them as a person and feel less racial prejudice towards them. So we'd give you two examples. First of all, we talk about France where Muslim populations are very small social enclave and are therefore discriminated against. And then we look at like Canada and the US. So what occurred in Canada and the US is that you had like Asian populations who were originally persecuted when they moved to these countries. You had like the Chinese head tax. You had a lot of the problems we see in Europe right now. But as these populations increased and as growth and immigration increased, these populations became integral to the success of these nations. People like um, Asian Americans make up a large percentage of the people at university, make up a large percentage of the people in strong positions of power. We actually think that society, as there's more social integration, as these populations become more significant political entities, we actually see more social cohesion and we don't see the problems they're talking about today. We also see soft power taking account here. So if you eat at an Indian restaurant, we think you're more like receptive to Indian people too. Like that's some sort of thing where if you accept a culture, you also like the people behind it. Okay, very quickly, cultural climate. We first of all say that the cultural issues of Europe are a cause behind certain problems. So in terms of like social programs, we look at like Greece where people want to have low taxation as well as high social programs, and they simply cannot continue to do this. We actually think there's cultural like views in certain European countries that restrict growth, that restrict a society's ability to like eliminate, to increase taxes or do things like that. And so people who come in who have different cultural perceptions are beneficial in that aspect in terms of diluting the culture of that nation. Second of all, we talk about enmity. We think that a lot of times European countries are, six, are selfish and can't integrate with the EU because of old historical tensions. Those would go away. Finally, we talk about like ethnic tensions as well. Those decrease like the um, cultural integration within Europe and therefore economic success. Those would decrease under our model as well. So for all these reasons, both in terms of culture, both in terms of practical economic benefits, side proposition proposes this motion today. Thank you. neighbors make good walls, good walls make good neighbors. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not the BNP, we are not the true Finns. It is unreasonable for Team Proposition to impose the burden of defending closing off Europe's borders for us. Let's make it date clear. We are not racist, we are not xenophobic, we are not against immigration as a general principle. Rather, what we are going to argue is that the pace and nature of immigration 
as it is happening in Europe today, is unsustainable, extrapolating from current trends. In support of this, we are going to bring you three arguments. I'll prove to you that first, the current rate of immigration threatens Europe's political identity. Second, that it fractures European society. While my second speaker will show that it harms Europe's economy, and we directly clash the criteria that they have set up. But before I go into my constructive matter, I would like to address two points of contention. First, on economics, and second, on culture. First point, on economics. And here, team proposition brought to us logic about an ageing population that somehow demands an increase in immigration in order to resolve this issue. We have a couple of responses to this. First of all, we don't think that the solution to an ageing population is necessarily to bring in more migrants. In the status quo, we already see an exponential growth in the number of migrant arrivals into Europe. In 2000, 12% of Germany's population were immigrants. In 2008, the figure had risen by one and a half times to 18%. Rather, there are a variety of other instruments that we can use to resolve this problem of an ageing population. We have seen success stories in places like the Nordic countries, like Finland, where they have reversed the falling fertility rate by becoming more accepting of births out of wedlock and of single-parent families. We don't need more immigration to resolve an ageing population. But even if we are to accept that their logic, we don't think the issues of taxation or entrepreneurship they talk about are resolved if you bring more migrants. Why? Let's think about it. More than 93% of migrants into Europe take up low skilled positions. Clearly, the net benefit they bring in the majority of circumstances is minimal. Even if you are to consider menial jobs, we reject the analysis that locals within Europe are unwilling to take out such roles. For instance, in Greece, we see a youth unemployment rate of more than 70%. The only reason why they are unwilling to take out such jobs is that migrants are coming in depressing wages and accepting horrible working conditions that we think run contrary to the spirit of Europe. For all these reasons, we think that the economic arguments fall on our side of the house. Next, let's look at this idea of culture. And here, Let's note that the premise of all of team proposition's arguments rely on the idea that migrants are able to integrate into Europe. They claim that the reason why migrants have not been able to integrate is that there are not enough migrants within Europe. No, ladies and gentlemen, the more migrants there are, the less likely it is for them to integrate. Why? Because they can survive as an exclusive community, retreating into ghettos and ethnic enclaves, and as a consequence of that, form a resistant force within Europe. Then they talk to us about soft power. And really, this was the third section one I know, so I'm going to respond to it, giving it the, the gravity it deserves. They claim that somehow by eating in an Indian restaurant, they will become more receptive to Indians. <laughs> really? Seriously, ladies and gentlemen? We don't think so. I'm going to show you why this is not the case in a constructive argumentation right now. First point on how the current pace of immigration threatens the political identity of Europe. Since we are at this esteemed tournament, let's ask ourselves a very simple question. What is the heart of Europe? We postulate that Europe is defined by two main political structures. One, liberal democratic values, and two, the welfare state. First of all, Europe is founded on liberal democratic values, which respect the fundamental human rights of every individual. Unfortunately, many immigrants from today come from cultures that don't necessarily share these ideals of things like religious freedom, gender equality, and free speech. Given that I've already shown you that they are often unwilling or unable to integrate, we think that they continue to bring these practices from their homelands and fail to abide by the principles on which Europe is founded upon. But before I go to show you why this is a bad thing, yes, madam. Isn't it better that these immigrants actually get a taste of perhaps what their countries should look like and could look like, rather than excluding them and never letting them see those potential benefits? Uh, no, because they aren't going to return home to turn their nations into some glowing example of a Western liberal democracy, ladies and gentlemen. Instead, what they are going to do is to try to impose their own beliefs onto the European societies that they live in. Because the fact of the matter is that with increasing globalisation, it becomes easier for them to stick together as a community, unlike the previous diasporas we have seen in the past. For instance, in Germany, we have seen Muslim couples who have demanded that their marriages are adjudicated by Sharia law, 
even though the tenet of Islamic law run contrary to the principles of gender equality and front within Germany's constitution. In Britain, we have seen a sudden spike in honour killings by Pakistani men who refuse to acknowledge that women have the right to go out into the streets without having to wear a burqa. Is this really the type of Europe that we stand for? No, we don't think so. Second of all, Europe is defined by a welfare state that provides a social security net for the most vulnerable within Europe. Unfortunately, due to a massive influx of migrants who are often poor and unable to support their huge families, they have placed a highly onerous burden onto these welfare systems, rendering them unsustainable. This is exacerbated by the Schengen area, as well as the extremely porous borders in places like Italy and the Mediterranean Sea, allowing illegal immigrants to infiltrate the continent. The consequence of this is that they take up huge amounts of resources as a result of the welfare state, rendering it financially unsustainable. That's why in the Netherlands, the nation had to cut back on unemployment welfare benefits as a result of a sudden 7.3% spike in the number of migrants in that country. Clearly, the current nature and pace of immigration threatens the political identity of Europe and does not present reason for hope. My second argument will show how the current pace and nature of immigration fractures European society. Our premise is that there's been a wave of alienation and dislocation due to a sudden influx of immigrants into Europe. This has led to the rise of extremist xenophobic parties, like the science scene in Ireland, which recently became a member of the ruling coalition. The consequence is that we have seen political discourse becoming more radical and becoming more toxic, exacerbating tensions within the liberals and the conservatives within society. And in itself, this presents a bleak political landscape for Europe. The corollary of this is that immigrants withdraw into their own ghettos and enclaves because they feel threatened by the hostile reception. The explosive mix of tensions has led to incidents like the 2005 riots in France, where the Algerian students living in the slums rioted and killed more than 100 people in the country. For all these reasons, we see that immigration paints a bleak picture for Europe because it threatens to fracture the social constructs of European society. As such, we see that new strangers mean new dangers go with team opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a side opposition today that comes up and doesn't fully understand what an immigrant does for a country. They don't seem to understand like the benefits that exist in an immigrant, and we saw this because they seemed to like they failed mostly to clash with a lot of what our first argument was today. Further to this, we see that like they think that xenophobia is decreased when you like don't have people interact. They think that xenophobia is decreased when like groups are just pushed apart and never have the opportunity to interact with each other. And like further to this, we saw this great analysis on how like we have an aging population in Europe, therefore we just think the people in Europe should have more kids. We don't think that this is the solution. We don't think that's ever actually going to happen. Like so, before I get into like our third and final constructive argument today on side proposition, which is the international ties that come from immigration, I'm going to get in to a refutation of exactly everything they've said so far. 
So this first idea they came up with was they said that like an aging population is going to be fixed by people in Europe having more kids. First, we don't think that this is the case. We think like in a country or in like a continent that's struggling, struggling economically, we don't see that like people are suddenly going to now have five kids and be able to support them all. Like we don't think that that's going to happen. We don't think that that's like a legitimate reason or like a way of repopulating Europe. So further this, they came up with this idea that like people are going to come in and accept poor working conditions. We'd say that normally when people are immigrating, they're leaving their country because they've faced like poor or working conditions. They've lived in countries where like they don't get um, respect for the work. They don't get the pay for the work that they think that they deserve. We see them immigrating for these reasons. We think they're moving to places because they think their situation is going to be better, not because they're going to be moving in to a country that, think it's, that thinks it's going to be worse. We see that like further this, we see a lot of innovation that occurs in these countries because we have immigrants moving in, which is a lot of what Jesse talked about in her first speech. We saw like when people come in and move to other countries, we see, we see like benefits to their different culture. Ben I'll take you in a moment. Benefits to their culture, benefits to like their international relations. We see a lot of benefits that come in. Yes. Woman should think that the Algeria is going to grow to get a better job and set a good life and then return to its home nation is going to be able to have five kids and support them. We think that like, if people are coming in from Algeria and coming into a new country, it's because they think they're going to have a better life in this country. We think that first off, they're going to be able to obtain some sort of job. We think that if you're moving into a country, you're going to have some sort of like plan on how you're going to support your family. We don't think people like move blindly. They don't think they're going to be able to do anything better in this new country. We think that people like are rational enough to come up with some sort of plan. Like we think that like this is sort of what we're saying today on side proposition. For this, they said that like it's going to put um, more migrants into social on. So like the more people we have in these societies, they're just going to be more divided. We think that the more people we let in, actually the more likely people um, of that country itself or of like the continent of Europe are going to be able to interact with these people. We think that like it's having those small, my, like very, very my, minor populations that allow those people to live in like very small social enclaves. We think that when there's more people, and especially when they join positions like government roles or like police officers, for example, or like any position where they're able to interact with large groups of society, we think that's what's beneficial. We think that's what creates like social contact and more interaction. So let's get into like their main sort of points today. They talked about this idea of like the current rate of immigration in Europe and they came up and said that like people immigrating don't have the same values. First off, like they kind of said that like they don't respect the same human rights standards and things like that. We think that this is like a fairly vast assumption and like like we don't really think that this is true. We don't think that, like human rights we think are like first off, we think they're fairly standard. But in addition to that, we think that like if if countries do have like different human rights standards, we think that it's like a good and beneficial for a lot of these immigrants if they're moving into these countries to learn about different human rights standards and like if they're moving into these countries it's their responsibility to then accept these human rights standards like we don't think that they're going to then move into these other countries and then like not accept these standards we think that like you make the active choice when you move into a country to respect the laws and respect like the values of that society so like we don't think this is like that that's actually a bad thing further that like we think if like immigrants have different ideals different values we think that that's fine like we think that actually that can benefit a lot of societies as well and like add to um, and add to like a group and like mutual understanding of a lot of different cultures. We're fine with that. So this next idea was that they talked about like um, this idea of like current immigration fractures society. And I've already sort of gotten into this with the, this idea of xenophobia. Like we today on side proposition believe that like you decrease xenophobia by increasing social contact. Like the more people that you have that are able to interact with different groups of society, the less likely you are to be xenophobic of them. We think that like when you have groups of society that are always inconsistently interacting, we think that like it's very difficult for you to like maintain your racist stance. So let's see, so let's get into the third and final point today on side proposition, and that is this idea of international ties. So what we see is that like Europe needs and wants more international contact in order to like stay relevant and successful in today's society. Like we've seen this when they created the EU. We've seen this when they joined NATO. Like we see like NATO's an international body. They created the EU to like remain economically and internationally powerful. But we see like what the thing is is that we see that like, they stand to gain more benefits and like for, by backing that up with internationalism from within. Like we think that there's a lot of benefits that come with immigrants. Like we think that there's an incentive first off to engage not only with like it within European society but within the countries that these immigrants are coming from like we think that what you do when you allow immigrants into your country is you allow for the countries to have like relations with these countries we think that like you increase trade for example we think that like they now have these two countries now have like or the continent of Europe and whatever country these people have moved into and like the countries of their homeland we think that you actually create like those countries now have the best interests of each other at heart because we see citizens living in one country and like they have obviously unrespect and need for the 
the country that they're living in to respect and like appreciate their homeland. We think that like we create a lot of trade and ties this way. Like we see that in these kinds it creates like a mutual understanding in these kinds of societies. We think that's incredibly beneficial. We look to examples where like people have immigrated to one country and then been able to immigrate home to their other country and bring back money and bring back like certain you know things they've learned for example. We look to the example of the US and Philippines. We think that like a lot of people went to the US from the Philippines, immigrated to the US, worked in the Philippines for or, sorry, worked in America for a while and then decided to go back to their home country. We think that, like this, we saw the two very distinct cultures that now have a greater mutual understanding of each other, now have more not only like social ties, but more like political and economic ties with each other. And we've seen like we've seen things like trade uh, like exponentially increase between these two countries. We think that's incredibly beneficial, like for the Philippines, for the US, and for like the citizens in both of those countries to be able now to like further interact with each other. Yes. How does the Pakistani man killing his wife because of some perverse notion of a woman's role contribute to the cultural diversity of Britain, as you claim? Okay, we, first off, we think that's just illegal. Like, we don't think that people can go around <laughs> killing anyone. Like, we, we don't think that's legal in any country whatsoever. So, like, if someone moves to Britain and, like, regardless of where they're from, decides to kill their wife, well, they can go to jail. Like, I don't think it matters if it's in Britain or if it's in Pakistan. So, like, let's get into the third, like, let's get into this main idea and continue with our constructive material. So, first we came up with, the, or, sorry, first we're saying, like, spheres of influence. We think that, like, there's a lot of harms that come about when shutting out immigration or when, like, decreasing the amount of immigration you have. We'd say that it creates a lot of resentment. We'd say it creates a lot of like practical hostility between two nations. And we say that this is actually exacerbated when you have previous or previous countries that were colonized by European countries. We'd say that like this only like reaffirms ideas of colonialism and like brings back ideas of inequality. We see that like this is incredibly harmful and this makes the problem a lot worse under their stance today. So this next idea that like both when more ties are created, but not only more ties, but more positive and benef beneficial ties are created, we see that like this creates countries that are more willing to give to each other, are more willing to interact with each other, and are more willing to trade with each other. This next idea is actually the benefit to the individual immigrants within these countries. We see that like a lot of the times immigrants are leaving systems that are actually, or like leaving places that are worse off, or sorry, when they're living in these countries, they're used to um, systems back in their homeland that are much worse off. We see these people now appreciating what they have, like appreciating what Europe offers to them, appreciating like the laws and systems within Europe that they are now able to live by. We see that like this increases things like they're more likely to follow their laws they're more likely to like increase like legitimacy in the government we see like all of these things are incredibly beneficial so for all the reasons today that we stated on side proposition we beg to propose thank you If you've watched The Hunger Games, you'll remember the line from the president of Pennon when he stated that hope is the second strongest emotion apart from fear. And I'm going to be showing you why there's a lot more reason to be scared than hopeful in two points of contention. First of all, on culture. Second of all, on economics. In first proposition, they brought us a range of supposed benefits for, uh, about culture brought about by immigration into Europe. Soft power, diversity, etc., etc. Then second proposition also came up to tell us about how individual immigrants also benefit from going to Europe. This paints for you a picture of a very happy, prosperous family of Europeans and immigrants who work together and strive for a better European future. Well, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm sorry, side proposition, because I have to shatter that fairy tale for you. We've given you the fact that immigrants tend to live in atomized enclaves, meaning there's little interaction between immigrants and the rest of European society. And if this is true, which we've proven to you that it is, none of the benefits that they've talked about, no thank you, can accrue. We've given you multiple examples. For example, the Kurdish population, uh, the Kurdish population which lives in an enclave in Berlin. They see that they haven't told us any examples of immigrants actually integrating with other Europeans. Therefore, we say they are an unrealistic side. They had a couple of answers to this. 
First of all, that the only reason for this is that there aren't enough immigrants. First of all, we say there are more than enough immigrants. There are six million Algerians alone in Europe. If you think that's not enough, I don't know what is. Second of all, they told us that as more immigrants come in, there will automatically be more interaction. We say that's not true. As more immigrants come in, they're just going to enter these enclaves and make these enclaves larger because it's obviously a lot easier and it'll make you a lot happier to live with people from your own country than to mix with other Europeans. We say that logic doesn't stand. We also told you that immigrants are fundamentally different in their our culture and outlook from Sorry. other Europeans. Therefore, there's little opportunity for interaction. So this is my first opposition speaker's point. Right? He told you that, the, that immigrants' outlooks, such as in, in terms of things like trying to impose Sharia law or honor, honor killings, are fundamentally different from those of Europeans. This is why the rate of immigration has been increasing since the 1990s, but Europeans are still resentful of them. They told us, they gave us two responses to this. First of all, that this is an assumption. We say no, we've constantly given you examples of resentment, like honor killings, like Sharia law. You haven't given us any in return. Second of all, they told us that, oh, these immigrants, it will benefit them to learn about human rights. We say that an, 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 an Iraqi person who fled from the violence that is going on in his country to go to Europe didn't go there to learn about human rights. He went there to get an opportunity for his family to prosper. Clearly, they, they, they're not there to learn about, your, about, about European systems, right? Last of all, they tried to laugh at us in the last speech, telling us that honor killings are illegal. We say, yes, obviously they're illegal, but the fact is that they dilute the social values of Europe and they engender resentment against these immigrants. They haven't dealt with the heart of this point. Next, they tried to tell us about soft power. My first speaker already told you that this is ridiculous. You don't appreciate Indian people like me more just because I give you Indian food, right? And they drop this in their next speaker, meaning that they clearly aren't prepared to hold on to the key point of their case. I want to evolve, you, evolve this argument one step further by telling you that if you only interact with Indian people when you eat Indian food, you're clearly going to think that people like me are only valuable for our Indian food, right? So clearly, that side doesn't enter any more interaction between Indians and, uh, between Europeans and other people. Um, next, they told us that, uh, oh, individuals, oh yeah, I've already dealt with this point, right, that individuals don't, individual immigrants don't benefit because they don't go to Europe just to learn about human rights. Last of all, under this point of contention, I'm going to tell you that immigration clearly isn't the correct mechanism to bring about cultural diversity. If you want to bring about cultural diversity, send your students to other universities. You can do so many other things about from bringing in millions of immigrants into your continent. Clearly, immigration isn't the, clear, isn't the best solution to bring about, bring about their diversity. Clearly, therefore, they bring about little cultural benefit due to the extremely fast pace of immigration. Second of all, immigration is an integral to their benefits. Next point of contention about economics. Again, they gave us a range of economic issues, right? They told us about an aging population, immigration, uh, innovation and growth. Let's deal with innovation and growth first. First of all, they haven't given us any examples of how, in, how innovation, no, th no thank you, can, can result from immigration. And um, yeah, they, next they told us that, oh, you can leave our country, uh, oh, next they told us that, that, um, that Europeans, that immigrants would actually come into Europe because um, they have a bet opportunities to get better living conditions. Right? We told you that Europeans only come into Europe because um, that the immigrants who come into Europe Sorry. come into Europe to get menial jobs. The answer to this is that no, they won't get menial jobs because they have better conditions, because they come to Europe in search of better conditions. We say that on the comparative, clearly if they come into Europe, they get better conditions than they have if they stay in their home countries. Therefore, that point doesn't stand. Let's talk about the aging population, right? We told you that um, why we must use immigration as a solution. There are so many other solutions. They told us that, oh, there's no other solution. But clearly, there's no other, that clearly, um, public campaigns and things like that are the only solution. Because if you bring about, if you deal with an aging population by increasing immigrants um, who have low skills and are able to fill in the kind of jobs that the Europeans have, clearly, that isn't the solution to, European, to, um, to, to an aging population. Last of all, it's the deal with international crowd. They told us that, oh, you increase trade between countries and everyone loves each other because of that. Let's give you an example, right? We tell you that Algeria is angry with France because France is draining the young men, and France is angry with Algeria because of illegal Algerian immigrants. Clearly, this example applies, applies across the board to all um, countries, all poorer countries that have immigration into Europe. Last of all, he told us that, oh, people go back and bring their culture back to their home countries. First of all, they are prepared to use people as tools for social engineering. Second of all, these immigrants aren't going back to their home countries because they're coming to Europe to search for better opportunities. Last of all, clearly, they are immigrants. They are not there to bring back European culture. They are there to get better opportunities. Let's move on to my substantive argument about hurting Europeans, uh, Europe's economy. Let's first analyze who exactly these immigrants are. The vast majority of these immigrants um, are people with low skills and who enter low paying jobs. Why? The largest, uh, largest population of immigrants are the Kurdish people from the Middle East who come from places like Turkey, Iran and Iraq. The second largest population comes from Algerians who have 6 million people in Europe. 
The characteristics of this population is that they often are often not highly educated because they are unable to afford good education back in their home countries. This is why they come to Europe for better opportunities. Second of all, they tend not to be familiar with the native language of Europe, right? Because you can't expect an Iraqi to know French or German. Third of all, they tend to be unfamiliar with cult the culture and business practices of Europe. This is why companies are unable to hire them for higher end service industries, and require, which require them to be uh, require a high degree of interpersonal relations between them and other Europeans. And I'd like to take a POI here if you have any. Okay, Thank you. Sure. So, can you tell us why it's a problem if people are coming to a nation and they actually have contacts in another country that boy things like trade, boy understanding between those countries, and they still like have interactions okay, between those okay, countries? Okay, okay, okay. So, so, let's say this street, right? An Iraqi person who flees from Iraq because there's a massive war going on in this country, is somewhat able to stimulate international trade and ties between Iraq and, say, France. That's just not true, right? They don't have that kind of cloud. They don't have that kind of power. If you're being unrealistic here, side proposition, try and prove some causal links before you tell us that argument. So moving back to my case, the corollary of this is that immigrants tend to take up low-skilled, low-paying jobs, which are the only jobs that they have access to. Right? And this means that this is why the average income of immigrants in Europe are 1,000 euros lower than the average income of native Europeans. This means that, that, this means that uh, wages are depressed for low-skilled jobs, meaning that native Europeans have lower wages because, as they've already said, uh, immigrants are willing to accept lower wages because of their lower expectations. This, let's take this, uh, th this means that what happens is that there's more unemployment for Europeans who have lower skills because the immigrants displace them from their jobs. This brings about a higher rate of crime because people are driven, driven to desperation, lower living standards when they can't afford more, more, um, more luxury goods, and last of all, more inequality because Europe leaves behind its lower skilled workers while benefiting immigrants. And it is for all these reasons that their side is, an, an, is an, an, a realistic one and that our side should take this debate. <laughs> of a good thing, side opposition actually conceded that it was a good thing. They tried to take a sort of twisted stance by telling us that too much immigration was bad, but by taking that approach, they've somehow conceded the fact that if you limit it a little bit, immigration in and of itself is still a positive thing. So when we challenged them to tell us why closing off their borders would actually send a negative message, they chose not to take that burden because they couldn't prove it. They shifted their burdens because they recognized it was unprovable with the case they had chosen to run because they failed to adapt. We don't think they've taken the case today. They think we've also had another, a lot of other contradictions. Like their first speaker tried to tell us that these immigrants are so strong in their belief that they'll hurt the heart of Europe, and at the same time they told us that they're so weak that they'll be bullied around by the BNP and that'll create other tensions. We think they needed to take a clearer stance, they needed less contradictions. Let's run through their case on three points. Let's talk about immigrants, let's talk about the effects on the international community, their countries they're coming from, then let's talk to you about the effects of Europe themselves. First of all, they told us about this idea of immigrants, that they aren't going to respect human rights, they're going to impose their own beliefs. First of all, I've already told you there's a bit of a contradiction to say they're also going to be bullied around. But furthermore, we'd say that no immigrant ex tries to go to Europe with the idea that they want to take away human rights, right? Like, these are individuals who are oppressed by their own state, who don't like the fact that they can be entrepreneurial, who don't like the fact that their basic human rights aren't respected. They want to move to a better place, they don't want to make a better place work. We think that their side has assumed that all humans are intrinsically evil, immigrants especially. We simply don't think that is true. Secondly, they would say that, like, are immigrants going to want to interact? They've taken the assumption that these, like, no thank you, that these uh, immigrants are going to form uh, enclaves and are going to become more exclusive, like Kurds in Britain. We have several responses. First of all, when these immigrants come in such mass numbers, they are forced to integrate into society by taking rules within government, by taking rules within jobs that already exist. You can't just expect an immigrant population to come up and set up all of their own job structure. They need to actually sort of integrate to the specific point that they can survive in order to actually be there for longer. We don't think that they can survive alone. They have to integrate to survive. No, thank you. We also think that this idea of like Kurds in Berlin is a problem because the states aren't accepting of them. The reason that they force their own enclaves isn't because they don't want to 
interact, it's because others don't want to interact with them. We think the responsibility is on it Europe to accept them. No, thank you. So that's this idea with, like, do immigrants actually take away jobs? We told you that Europeans actually have this sort of egocentric approach where they don't think that they're, like, worth taking these sort of menial jobs, right? We told you about the problems with a lot of bureaucracies. So we don't think that these Europeans actually do want them. But even if they did, we don't think that that's harmful because because you are filling these menial positions, you're still fueling the economy. So regardless of who fills them, it doesn't matter because those jobs are still being filled. It's still benefiting the state overall. They haven't contested that. Let's deal with this idea of are immigrants entrepreneurial, are they intellectual, no thank you. They didn't like address Al uh, Jessica's point about how immigrants who are intellectual will want to go to a country where those intellectual ideas are appreciated, they never dealt with that. But their response to their idea of like, are immigrants entrepreneurial, they said that like, well they aren't, they only take menial jobs. They say this is false, when there are no opportunities in their own home countries to like have entrepreneurial large businesses because there aren't any customers and because there's no support by an oppressive government, we think that their best choice is to move to a state where their ideas are accepted. Now let's just deal with the idea of what do they look like. They told us that the people who immigrate are large families and people who don't speak the same language. The first assertion is simply false, right? Like according to a lot of like reports and like Ravenstein's laws of migration, the people who are most likely to immigrate are young single men. They are the most mobile, they're most likely to take jobs. People with large families don't immigrate because it's difficult. They want to test the climate. It's typically those men who go and then send remittances back to their family. That was a false assertion on their side. No thank you. They also said that, like, well, they don't speak the language, so it's difficult. So what? Immigrating can be hard. We think those immigrants, like, accept that risk. They consciously go into it. They know that it's going to be difficult, but they're willing to take that risk. Then they, um, they said that, like, why are they, like, why are they moving? Um, we, they, like, they said that, like, that, okay. No, thank you. So now let's deal with this idea of like international and other countries. And they didn't really respond a lot to this, and it was unfortunate because it was a large part of the debate. We, uh, we would ask you why innovation is happening elsewhere. Why is innovation happening in Asian countries and not in European ones? And we responded to you by telling that that Europe hasn't had a new reformation, right? Like they haven't had a renaissance in a really long time. They haven't had a reformation in a really long time. And that's been harmful to them because they haven't actually been able to respond to the world in a globalized way. We told you how that happens when they allow other international voices into their own stage, they didn't respond to that. Point of information, Megan. Sure. Even if we accept that the immigrants are talking about are going to become entrepreneurs, they are going to leave and return to their home countries once they can amass their wealth. Your strategy for resolving the problem is unsustainable. Okay, we think that they might choose to stay in Europe and include the climate there because they're accepted in Europe, right? And they have customers in Europe. So they might choose to stay in the country that actually fuels their business, right? Okay, so then they gave us this example of like Algeria and France. We already told you that these tensions exist because the country isn't welcoming them, it's not accepting of them. Instead, they try to scapegoat one another. We think that the blame actually lies in the country who isn't accepting our model solves that. Ali's soft PowerPoint stayed mostly uncontested until in the, like, the final 30 seconds, their second speech told us that the reason they're moving is because they're fleeing wars. We think that when individuals flee wars, they're typically refugees who don't have a lot of money, who don't really have passports, who don't have the ability to like get a visa to immigrate to Italy. These are people who are poor, who have no beings to their name, who flee to the next neighboring country because that's as far as they can get. Right? Like We reject the idea that all of the immigrants from Syria are fleeing into Germany because that's really easy. We think they're going next door into Jordan because that's the only option open to them. Now let's deal with this idea of Europe. They told us that the better instrument for improving population is pronatalist policies. Two problems. First of all, simply when you have a population over the age of 60, like you can still encourage them to have children, but it's physically not possible, right? Like it's just not going to happen. Furthermore, we think it's a bit of a nationalist perspective for them to tell us the only way to increase populations is if those citizens are legitimately like national, right? That they can't come from other places. They have to be from that nation. We think that's xenophobic. It assumes that other people aren't as legitimate. Cultural climate, will it change? They didn't deal with the fact that we told you it's going to dilute old tensions, like between France and, uh, and the Great Britain. Like we think they have tensions right now that are going on because of actions that happened hundreds of years ago. When you have new views, those dilute those old entrenched views, and that's a beneficial thing. They didn't deal with that. We hope it comes out in their third speech. So what happens to xenophobic parties? They told us that it, they grow, they create tensions. We think that their model actually justifies the actions of groups like the BNP by telling they're legitimate and that Immigrants are bad and take away jobs and we should shut them out of the country, right? So under their model, you justify all of these xenophobic groups by telling them they're right. They need to address that. Finally, they told us it would dilute social values. We don't understand why groups would, 
would move willingly to countries where they know that their views are more accepted where they live, right? So if my views are accepted in a country that's very different than Europe, why would I move if I know that like, I'm not going to like it, if I'm not going to be accepted? We think that's more important to individuals than perhaps their economic well-being. Finally, this idea about like Indian food. We think that like a little bit of contact, bit by bit, is better than none at all. If I can try a little bit of dal, I'm probably going to be more likely to like maybe put on a sari once in a while and listen to some Bollywood music. We think that like it's probably better that these people get integrated little by little than never getting anything at all. We need an accurate response to that. So because we've painted a better picture of the immigrants, we've had more analysis about the effects internationally and on the other countries. We've shown you how Europe will actually benefit under our model. We are proud to propose. <laughs> gentlemen is not necessarily merrier. This has been the base principle that side opposition has stood for throughout this debate. Before I move on to the main contentions of today's debate, a small clarification. Now, in their first speaker and their third speaker, probably their second speaker decided it was all right, they decided to push an unreasonable burden on side opposition. They told us that we need to prove that Europe should close off its borders. Ladies and gentlemen, European nations are not North Korea. They are never going to close off their borders. Immigration, immigration will always be a part of European society. What we disagree with is the nature of peace of European society, and we disagree with the idea that it presents a positive hope for the future. That is our burden today. Let's make that very clear. So I'll be looking at this debate to three main angles. Firstly, I'll be looking to the social and cultural angle. Secondly, I'll be looking at it through the economic angle. And lastly, on the political angle. So firstly, on the social and cultural uh, angle, we will talk to you time and again about how immigrants coming within these nations have different cultural values. Now, I think on this debate, we have a side proposition that's clearly confused about what they wish to conceptualize immigrants as. So let's just be clear and identify the issue that immigrants exist on a spectrum. They aren't one-dimensional, as side proposition would have it. There are immigrants who come to our nation to as single men who work as menial jobs because they have low skills and low education. The idea that they're going to take up government's posts or become CEOs is just fundamentally ridiculous because a low skill uh, Iraqi is far, likely, far more likely to work in a petrol station than become the Minister of Education. Let's just be realistic here. Then the other spectrum of immigrants are those who come here and have children or bring their entire families here. We've already told you that in our, in our first speaker's point, how this produces a huge burden on the welfare state because many of these immigrants are poor and low skilled. On the other end of the spectrum, there's immigrants who come and join middle class jobs such as software engineers from India. Firstly, we tell you that these immigrants are the small, small minority of cases. Even in this situation, we still think that they bring their social and cultural values with them when they immigrate. The idea that these immigrants are very open to integration is simply untrue. We see that as more and more immigrants come into the nation, as opposed to their model, where they assume that more immigrants equals to more integration, what happens is more immigrants, in fact, raise more exclusivity. Because we see they have an established community of people who look like them, talk like them, and dress like them. Therefore, it's very easy for them to join these communities. They have no incentive to integrate. The idea of cultural diversity and cultural acceptance is contingent on, firstly, the idea that these immigrants are able to immigrate, uh, are able to integrate and that Europeans are able to accept them. Clearly, we've proven to you that both these conditions do not exist. Therefore, the issue of cultural diversity doesn't really stand. 
Now they bring this facile and simplistic notion of soft power, which I think reveals their racist mindset in their third speaker, because they think that eating dal, wearing a sari, automatically makes one Indian. We see that this, this shows that cultural identity clearly hasn't worked for them, because if you can see me, I'm not eating dal right now, and I'm not wearing a sari, yet I'm Indian. We say that this is the kind of values, this is the kind of stereotypical mindset that they, they promote through their immigration policies. Clearly, social and cultural integration is not achieved in their side. Now, they, we, we bring you numerous examples and analysis of the social fracturing that occurs through immigration. Examples that they've completely misunderstood and misrepresented. But before I prove to you why these are important, I'll take you, ma'am. Why is it okay for a national UK citizen to be poor and have a lot of children, but not for an immigrant family to be exactly the same way? We see that the case is fundamentally different because we see that European countries have always prioritized the welfare state. But when immigrants come in, they put further burden on the welfare state. And many of these immigrants are poor, unskilled immigrants who do not contribute positively to economic society as a whole. We've also raised you examples of how extremely porous borders allow for easy, illegal immigration. Now we talk to you about how social fracturing occurs and we think that this isn't a point that we can dismiss easily because we've seen examples of riots in place like Paris. We've seen examples of the rise of xenophobic right-wing parties across Europe. This is clearly an example of the social structures of Europe fracturing because of the pressures put on them by rapid immigration. Clearly, social and cultural integration is not achieved in their side. Now moving on to the next issue of, e of economy. Now they bring us to it to first, the first main idea that they bring to you is that these are individuals who are fleeing from, are fleeing from oppression in their homeland. They actually have amazing ideas of entrepreneurship and becoming great CEOs and they use Europe as a mechanism through which they can use it. Firstly, entrepreneurs in European nations which have high standards of education already are very, very rare and few and far between. Yet countries like Iraq and Algeria are filled with entrepreneurs who are just dying to go to Europe for the, where their ideas are accepted. Clearly, this is a simplistic notion that European immigrants will bring in innovation. And we've never given you concrete examples of how this innovation actually takes place and whether immigrants are actually capable of bringing in innovation. On the contrary, we told you that in a vast majority of cases, they take menial jobs. And let's not be fooled by their analysis that Europeans don't want these jobs. With a 70% youth unemployment rate across Europe, Europeans will take any job they can. But because, Europe, because immigrants are filling up these positions, these jobs are, uh, the Europeans cannot enter into these jobs, and therefore Europeans are unfairly compromised. They also bring us this analysis of the taking moments on the, on the total fertility rate being low and the issue of the aging population and how immigration works to save it. But before I prove this wrong, go ma'am. Can you explain why it matters who fills a certain position as long as like, someone fills it and contributes to the state and the economy? Well, we see that clearly the situation is when local citizens are displaced. The vulnerable groups in European society are the ones that are hit the hardest because these are the groups that need these menial jobs in order to survive. These are the Europeans with low skills. We see that when these positions are filled with immigrants, these Europeans are compromised. This is why it does not have a positive hope for the future of Europe. It increases social fracturing and resentment against these immigrants. Now, the issue of ageing population. They think the ageing population can be easily solved by a huge influx of immigration, denying all our analysis on the social fracturing that it creates. Rather, we tell you that the solution to increasing total fertility rate, as we've seen in numerous Nordic countries that we gave you examples of, countries like Sweden, countries like Denmark, is to create a more open environment towards childbearing and women, and increase in gender equality, and increase in things like baby bonus schemes that allow women to have children, and an increase in support for single mothers. This is what raises the total fertility rate. It's not just an influx of immigrants. Don't tell us that everyone's over 60 and they can't have children. No, everyone's not over 60 is the problem is that people who are capable of having children don't want to and we need to encourage them to. That is the problem we see in Europe. And lastly on the issue of political integration in which they bring us a small point on how we have to increase international relations. Firstly they grossly overestimate the kind of power that these immigrants have. 
just because a Chinese person starts comes over to Europe and works it and and works in a construction firm doesn't mean that he can improve relations between China and France, for example. Clearly, you I overestimate the power that these immigrants have. Clearly, we've proven to you that immigrants do nothing to contribute to the social, economic, or political welfare of Europe. Therefore, they are not a positive hope. Go with side proposition. Opposition.
promoter acceptance of single parent family. For all of these reasons, we demonstrated to you that too much of a good thing is a bad thing, more is not necessarily next marrier. Sometimes we just have to accept that strangers mean danger. opposition case today was that they actually refused to engage with any of our material that made their case look weak. We think that when you say that, um, that in order to have a brighter future, you need to have immigration, that talks about all sorts of immigration, and that's what we did on our side of the house today. Low-income immigration, skilled immigration, immigration based on criteria. We don't think side opposition even tried to contend with the majority of these points that were brought up on our side of the house, probably because they thought, didn't think that they could win on them. We also think they've ignored two of our main actual constructive arguments today and completely danced around them in terms of their analysis, and we think that that doesn't stand because ultimately they only wanted to focus on social contact and a few economic points rather than actually dealing with the material that might in fact make their case look weak. So let's look at what exactly this debate came down to today. First of all economics, second of all social issues. What about economics? Okay, so the main thing that we, we brought up in our first speech today was this idea of an aging population, there's not enough people, it's a problem. Their main line of response to this was, you know what, well, we should just encourage people to have sex and it will all be better. We don't think that was a good enough response because first of all, you can't force people to have sex, Second of all, we just don't think it's as, fact, as effective as bringing people in to bore your population and make it larger. The second line of argumentation they took against it was, okay, these are people forming menial jobs, and therefore that's a problem because there's already unemployment in Europe. Well, first of all, we told you that like, in, in order for people to come in, they often take like, more difficult jobs than Europeans are willing to take. They often fill positions that still need to be filled because there's a lot of elderly people in the population, and they pay things like tax money to the government, which actually can support the wealth fair state that the rest of Europeans support. That came out in my first argument today. I also talked about the fact that people who come in from other cultures and aren't as ingrained in the welfare state demand less from the government in terms of like um, fulfilling their needs, and that was never dealt with on their side of the house. They didn't engage with our analysis about skilled individuals coming in. In fact, they kind of conceded that that was beneficial, to have like people coming in who are entrepreneurs, who actually know things about the ec economy and can like benefit them. They told you that it was a very rare circumstance where like skilled individuals come in, actually we don't think it is. Like these countries have certain standards for who they accept. They accept a lot of people from former colonies, specifically the UK. We don't actually think any of their analysis stood today and they refuse to actually engage with that point. Okay, in terms of entrepreneurship, what happened? We told you on our side of the house today that actually new industries are creative when people come in and form like cultural industries, when they come in and they have a greater focus on like science and technology than you see in Europe right now because innovation is happening elsewhere. That came in in Julia's speech. We don't think that was properly dealt with. They just told you that the people coming in probably aren't an entrepreneurs and they like stayed on that line of analysis their entire debate. We don't think that the people coming in are necessarily all like menial task individuals. I've already showed you why that's good, but they had to deal with this point and we don't think they did. They didn't deal with ideas about job creation, about how we're creating jobs for unemployed populations. We think that that's a problem. Finally, they never engage with Ali's point about international power. This idea that when, well they sort of engaged with it, but they only did it to blow it off, right? We told you that if you have friends and relations in another country, you're more likely to have political interaction with that country, trade with that country, all of these sorts of good things, and they just blatantly told you that that wasn't true. We think we provide you actual analysis. They couldn't just blow that point off. Very quickly, let's talk about social issues. So what came out in this debate was the idea of social contact. Their response to our like, argumentation that if you are more likely to see a person on the street who's of another race or culture, you're more likely to see them as a human being and understand them, was blown off on their side of the house by talking about social enclaves. This idea that they're going to form exclusive communities. First of all, we gave you a relevant example in the USA and Canada about how this actually didn't happen. And if you have more people in social positions in the government actually interacting with other individuals, it reduces social tension in the future. That wasn't dealt with. They didn't actually give us any examples to support their side of the house. Second of all, they talked about how the people coming in were like evil individuals who committed honor killings and didn't hold liberal democratic values. We talked about how the reason people come is often because they like the values of Europe and we expect them to accept them. So because we don't think side opposition engaged today, because we won on both the social aspects and the economic points, we ultimately think that side proposition won this debate. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much.